I own lots of drones and I have to make this video to address the bottom line that I find myself reaching all the time. There are tons of videos on the Mavic 3 Online nitpicking specs and tons of reviews over features and updates and hypotheticals. Will a competitor ever show up? The drone community has a lot of astronomers, not a lot of astronauts. It's very different when you're using these things in actual application. I'm doing this for a job. I do this for work for networks and clients broadcast stuff. I have to admit I'm at a point where every single time I'm in a situation where I need to get the absolute most out of a shot, the maximum quality out of every drone I use, the one that I'm reaching for is the Mavic 3. I will go into the technicals about this thing, but that's the bottom line that I keep getting to. This is just short of being an easy bake oven for getting the richest, crispest cinematic footage you can get out of any situation I throw it into. If it's sunset, sunrise, shooting something in deep shadows with a ton of light behind it, the dynamic range on this thing is so insane. Whatever I film, when I'm looking at it, I think it looks okay, and it winds up being much better than that when I actually go back later to edit it. This drone has one job, rich, beautiful, 5.1K footage, and it does its job very, very well. When it was launched, all the features weren't done. There was tons of drama online because people weren't happy with that. I would work with it still because the only thing I wanted out of it was that 5.1K footage. Now that it's had firmware updates and everything's in place, it's working how it should, this drone is a workhorse. Everything I've thrown it into, if I've said earlier, crazy sunsets, low light footage, cloudy days, shooting indoors, looking outdoors, the dynamic range is just strong enough to handle it all. That coupled with whatever is going on with the software that's changing the look of the image, I have an Inspire too. I can record video in RAW format and I have to for clients sometimes. So I've used a Micro Four Thirds sensor and I know what it's like to color grade the footage. I still don't know what it is that's different about this footage, but it's like it has this weird HDR balancing that they do for something really bright in the background and something dark in the foreground. And I can show you this too. Here is the normal footage and here is the D-Log footage. I've applied the official DJI LUT that they give. This is what it looked like before as well. And then you can see here's the graded version. I can only get the foreground to match in both of these, but I can't get the mountains and the sky to look the same unless I commit just to those and then the foreground is too dark. This was a really gloomy, hazy day. So switching back and forth, you can see that like something's going on with the software where it's leveling that out. Normally I hate that and I don't want it at all, but every time I film something with it, I'm completely like, I prefer that over manually grading the D-Log footage. So even on normal, I am blown away by how rich it's come out as well as vivid. Uh, the Mavic 3, the way it handles reds is way, way better than the Mavic 2 Pro did. That was an issue I had before. The greens and blues were like very strong with DJI for the longest time. The reds just weren't as vivid and that makes sunsets like weaker and not as strong. But since using the Mavic 3, that's been solved. So I guess DJI figured it out. And with the Cine version, you get even even more flexibility because you're shooting in ProRes. ProRes exists for somebody who's using a huge timeline who wants bigger, more reliable formats than H.265. H.265 is more compressed, is more work on your computer when you're editing. If you have a huge timeline with tons of footage, it just gets annoying after a while. With ProRes, you get a little bit more quality, and if you want to maximize the dynamic range at something like Sunset and you have a Micro Four Thirds camera, then ProRes fits the bill really well because it gives you a little bit extra room for flexibility when you're color grading. It's not make or break because you could film with H.265, but when you're working on a professional set, it, you don't want to turn that over. You want to be able to send them ProRes files. Who exactly is this drone for? Because if you look at the Air 2S on paper, it films 5.4K footage. Uh, the sensor isn't that much smaller. You'd think that it would be pretty much comparable to the same image quality as the Mavic 3, but in application, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but that just isn't really what's going on. If I ever see Air 2S footage next to Mavic 3 footage, I can spot the Mavic 3 footage right away. And I know this because it happens almost daily because I'm in these Facebook groups and I, I'm following forums. So when people post footage and I don't see the description yet, I can distinctly tell which one's the Mavic 3. It's just a very beautiful, rich, unique image. The blacks are very deep and I would be scared of that normally being stuck that way shooting in normal profile, but the data is rich enough and the sensor is big enough that the quality still stays there. So the Air 2S is a bang for the buck drone, insane quality for thousand dollars. I mean, a one inch sensor, I still can't believe that we're getting this much for that much money when years ago I paid more for a one over 2.3 inch sensor on the Mavic Pro. That was a fun drone, but that was the first one and we've come so far so fast. So now the Air 2S is like a thousand bucks, but if you're paying extra, you do get a lot for that. And the Mavic 3 is 
is just the drone you can throw in any situation and it will knock it out of the park. At least that's what's happened so far. Every time I try and stress test this thing to see like a really harsh sunset, I think it won't handle well, it does. Since firmware updates with the Mavic 3, the DJI Fly app works a little bit better. You have better custom controls. It just makes a lot more sense the way the layout is now. Before it was like they were like waiting for feedback or something, but I'm glad they updated it because it makes a lot more sense. The most important thing, I can adjust the cushioning and when I'm flying in cinema mode, if I, I like to make it way, way slower than whatever the defaults are. So I want much smoother panning, much smoother tilting with the gimbal. And now that I have those things, even flying it at the beach in strong wind, it's heavy enough that it doesn't make any difference at all. DJI makes really, really good gimbals. That's the, the best out of everything that they do. That's their 10 out of 10. But still with the Mini 2, it's a little bit noticeable because it's small enough. This thing is, is heavy enough and has a strong enough build that it does stand up to it a lot better. And one more thing to note, if you like photography, this one will hold the most still. Because of the size and the build, this does the best job holding still for something like a long exposure. I do that a lot, especially for hyperlapses. So for a one second long exposure, you're also shooting at night, which means that low light shooting is important. And with a micro four thirds sensor, this is your best option. The Mavic 3's low light is comparable to the Inspire 2. They're both micro four thirds sensors and I'm shooting at f2.8 on both of these cameras right now. The Mavic 3 went up a little later, so the sun is down more, but otherwise they perform within the realm to say that, yeah, these are the same thing, micro four thirds. We're not getting duped anywhere. On a larger sensor, you can go up to ISO like 800 if you really need to. I think 400 is the max I feel comfortable working with for video. It's better than not getting the shots, so yeah, use 1600 if you like really need to, but otherwise, these aren't full frame sensors, so being able to get any low light is a bonus, but you know, it's not gonna see in the dark. Low light filming is also a better time to use D-Log because you don't get the harsh contrast that comes with the normal profile. Another thing, if you wanna guarantee you have the most tool to work with, the dynamic range and that amount of data that you're filming with on the Mavic 3 Cine means that if you screw up and it happens, you have a lot more to work with to recover. This is a massive advantage that the Mavic 3 has over other drones with smaller data, smaller sensors. As soon as something is over or underexposed in a high pressure situation like for a job or an event where it's live and you have to do things on the spot and you don't have any pre-planning, if you shoot a little too bright or a little too dark, you have a ton of room to work with with the data to be able to recover things. I've been in situations like that where you have to get the shot right now and you don't have a second chance. And if you're facing the other way all of a sudden and you don't wanna screw around with the shutter, you just have to depend on fixing it in post. And I hate to say that, but yeah, I've been in that spot. And this is the drone that lets you do that. Even if it didn't catch it on the spot and you're a full stop underexposed, you can recover that. The footage is really flexible. So that's also a, like a really nice, like that's your safety net in case you screw something up. You'll see a ton of reviews where people put like a Mavic 3 against a, an Air 2S or something and they go next door because they're lazy. They film some trees because they can't think of anything else and it's a park. In the middle of the day, once again, you won't notice the difference between an Air 2S and a Mavic 3 on a small screen in 1080p. The Mavic 3 has beautiful rich color and lovely deep blacks and it retains a lot of shadow. Sure, if you know to spot those things, but if you're the average person, that's not putting these drones anywhere in their environments to test why you would pay more. You have to put this drone in an extreme situation. A perfect example is sunset. That's your most extreme lighting situation that's really common. So the next time you film a sunset and you have something in the foreground, pay attention to how rich the details are in the shadows because this drone blows the other ones I have out of the water. Shooting sunsets is starting to be really fun and a lot less stressful. That's also important if this is for work and you hear me talk about this in a town reel, shoot everything at sunset because people like that. It's really shareable on its own. People go bananas for sunsets. So this makes it again, an easy bake oven in that situation. So the price for the Mavic 3 Cine is the barrier of entry for shooting in ProRes, having a bigger sensor, having faster data transfer speeds because you're shooting to a one terabyte hard drive that's built in. And the other thing I have not mentioned yet, the RC Pro controller. The low point has been updated. Please Where to even begin about this thing? I mean, I could write an essay. I cannot believe I was so wrong about this RC Pro controller. Back when they finally made the announcement for the Mavic 3, and with the Cine version, you have to use this smart controller that comes with it. They force you to buy it. I was really mad. I was really annoyed. I don't want to pay extra for this remote I'm never going to use. I have a really big iPhone. I'll just use a controller like I did with the Mavic 2 Pro. I don't like being pressured into buying this thing. I completely regret everything I've said. My suggestion to you is not to get a version with this controller because this is the business class ticket for flying on an airplane. Your life is a lot better when you, you don't know what you're missing out on. And then once you get a taste of it, there's really no going back. I can't believe how much I look forward to flying this thing now that I don't have that third variable, which is your phone, the phone's battery, people texting you while you're flying, changing the screen brightness and whatnot. This thing is so rich and beautiful. You can change, it works like, like a smartphone. 
you can screen record, you can change the brightness, you can install apps, and it's made it so simple to have this, the Mavic 3, in a little Ninja Turtles lunchbox with this thing too, and that's all I have to think about. They're both charged. The phone and the app being separate, all that doesn't come into play. I can't believe it, but it makes that big of a difference. I'm just way more excited to fly this thing now. I hate that I sound like a DJI rep because they didn't send me this. I wish they did, but um, I had to buy my Mavic 3 Cine as soon as it, was, it came out to test it, but I'm super, super glad I got this version. You've got little wheels at the top, um, a record button and a photo button. I don't even have to use the extra buttons for like that you can customize. And I, again, I fly without the thumbsticks because I have big thumbs and it just helps me be more accurate when I'm in cinema mode. This is a really solid build though. This thing feels as heavy duty as the Mavic 3. It feels like a serious product and not like a toy. Like I've spoken before in other videos about reducing bottlenecks that DJI keeps approaching this point where you have bigger data with the Mavic 3. You've got a large enough sensor that this extra data makes sense now, reducing these bottlenecks while also keeping this drone as convenient as possible. It still folds, it will still fit in a lunchbox. The only thing it's lacking is interchangeable lenses. If it had that, there would be no reason for an Inspire 2. At this point, that really long lens is a unique enough look. It shoots in RAW and that's really cool. That's why I've got it around for network stuff. So they do have an option for that issue with interchangeable lenses, and that is the 7X lens. Right now, if you use the 7X lens, the 180 millimeter, you have to shoot in full auto. But surprise, while you're all here, I've got an announcement. DJI has a firmware update coming out for the Mavic 3 that allows you to shoot with manual settings on the 7X lens. So you can shoot in pro mode, adjust the shutter and the ISO, things like that. That is a really big deal because that's what I and everybody wanted the most. I've already got really good stuff with it, just shooting shooting in auto, so this it will be a big improvement. The other part about that firmware update, you'll be able to shoot in ProRes 422 HQ for way more data if for color grading and post-production, and 422 LT, which is a smaller version of the ProRes right now, but still obviously is ProRes and has a lot of quality. No matter what, the 7X lens is a really important tool to have if you're like working in utility or you're filming wildlife or you want to film surfers on a beach far away or something. Honestly, before it was a fun feature. It was a really cool fun feature, but you need manual settings to be able to provide this to people and I can't wait to be able to do that now that it's got manual settings. Every time I go back and look at my files, the footage that I want to watch first, the prettiest looking thumbnails always come consistently from the 7X lens. When you blow the footage up, it's 4K, 30 frames a second, and it's shot in auto, so there's some ISO. However, the image you can get from having a really long lens is so nice that even just the, the thumbnail is so eye grabbing. You can use this for like social media. If you film it and they like the shot, they'll take it no matter what, even if it was filmed on a GoPro. We see GoPros in like major movies all the time now. If the content is there and it's relevant and it's what they really want. So yeah, the footage is usable, but because it's shot in auto, it's not the first thing I'm jumping for. There are tons of shots I've taken though that I've gone right back to and watched again and again and gone, oh, that's actually really nice. I thought it was gonna be looking kind of janky because it was an auto, but it came out really nice. I talk to students about this all the time. Something you should think about while we're here, the better you get, the best shots you find are less and less about settings and way more about the conditions. So having a beautiful rich sunset with something to silhouette in front of it, you always see that on Instagram reels, tons of fog with mountain peaks sticking out the top. That's like probably your easiest win ever. Or with the 7X lens on a really hazy day when you have mountains cascading in the background, each of them will be a different shade and it gives you a ton of perspective. Sometimes you have to pick one evil over the other. Do you want it to be a little too bright and then you fix it later? or a little too dark and you hope that you can recover the shadows. So I do depend on shooting a normal and I used to say don't ever do that but now it gets me closer to what I want in the end. So I'm editing very very lightly and it's still coming out super rich. If it's for network stuff and you want to maximize quality, yeah, shoot in D-Log. When you learn more in this career path, you're going to find yourself in situations where you're fighting your camera a lot with this frustration where you see something super nice and then whatever you film, it just doesn't come out the same way. Then you try and edit it and the footage kind of falls apart. Then you get discouraged and you just rinse repeat. This is the drone that really does the opposite. This is dramatically better. Like you film something and you go, oh, that's going to be cool. And then you watch it again and again because it just does a good job at dealing with everything that you don't have to think that hard about it. And already in the preview, it still is like, I'm so excited to go look at this footage on a bigger screen. The battery time is a feature I don't wanna talk about. So it should be very telling that I am talking about it because at first I'm like, I don't care. Most of the stuff I'm filming, I'll get done in 10 minutes and I'll go recharge. But the battery is so good on this thing 
that I'll film and then come back and have 70% left and I'm like, I can get another flight out of this. And I find myself spending half the time charging or half the time stressing about batteries. I'll take it home and not film for a week and then still have battery left when I go to use it a second time. I am just not used to that because the other drones, they like, they're smaller, smaller battery packs, they drain quicker. If I leave it in the closet for a week, I feel iffy about taking it out in case I don't get whatever flight time it tells me I'm gonna get. But this one has been like, noticeably, I will just leave it hanging in the air while I'm changing settings and I don't have to stress about the battery until the bomb siren goes off at 20% and everybody starts looking at me. Most of the people watching this that are considering getting a Mavic 3 aren't value shoppers. They're not here because they want a discount. They want the tool that will get them the absolute best quality. A lot of the complaints about the price came from hobbyists because they don't have the incentive to get the best tool for the job. I've been a camera operator, motion graphics artist, full-time video editor for like a decade. Anybody in film world can tell you how much equipment costs. This is a flying 5.1K, 4 thirds inch Hasselblad camera that shoots raw photos hyperlapses, it's stabilized on a gimbal, and it will fly home to you, shoots ProRes, all these things individually are more expensive on the ground. These drones have always been underpriced. So my summary is, you can say what you want about this thing. At this point though, it is my go-to drone and I don't really need to take multiple with me. I don't need to take one for quality, the Inspire 2, um, one for fun, the Mini 2, and then an Air 2S just in case. I, I just wind up going with this alone because it does so much. It is becoming just the, the workhorse that gets everything done for me. So, so, so happy with the Mavic 3.